Well, listen, I mean, Frankenstein, a bit of an old war horse as a story. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's been revisited so many times, so many times. So what is your fresh take on this? Well, I think there are three things that are really interesting about the book that um, are often overlooked. The first one is, I mean, obviously it's 200 years since Mary Shelley wrote it. And unlike, say, a lot of science fiction, especially early science fiction from the 19th century, the central concept of it has never been, um, has not been overtaken by fact. You know, you look at Jules Verne and, and obviously the reality of the things he wrote about have long superseded him, so you only read it as a kind of steampunk curiosity. But Mary Shelley intuited at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of science as a business and medicine as a business, that it was the objective of science to create consciousness. And that was such a uh, forward-thinking and brilliant concept that it, I think it still speaks to us because we haven't achieved it. And at the same time, we, we constantly seem to be on the verge of achieving it, whether it's through artificial intelligence or through biotechnology. But we still, you know, at the same time, we don't even know what consciousness is. So I think it deals with a very central and um, profound issue that we have as human beings, which is what is it does it mean to be alive what does it mean to think and to me that was the, the part of the book that really moved me is the idea of the monster's dilemma that he, that he doesn't know how he was created and nor do we he doesn't know why he's here and nor do we he doesn't know what any of it's for and nor do we and that's why that the monster as a character i think speaks to us still and that's why i wanted to make a film that told the story entirely from his perspective because that seems to be rather moving. That um, he has all these questions that he wants to ask his dad. You know, who am I? Why am I here? Why did you, Why did you make me? You know, give me a Give me a fucking answer. You know, <laughs> we all, we'd all like the answers to these questions. I mm. made you. I made you because I'm in a Bernard Rose movie. Yes, there you go. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like you could almost treat it like a Shakespeare text. I mean, like you know, Danny. I mean, you know, Frankenstein. I mean, you know, you, everyone has their own interpretation. I think you know, of Doctor Frankenstein. So, I mean, what did you? Were you scared of it? Do you think no? This is something I can really do something with. Um, well, uh, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm always always scared when I, when I approach uh, any any subject or any or any role. But I've I've worked with Bernard for quite a few times now, so I. Feel there's a certain safety net uh, there. Um, what we uh, talked about was uh, having him be a sort of a, a Silicon Valley uh, um, plastic surgeon, Botox oriented guy who's who's come up with some sort of formula um, to create uh, life. And also, there's a, a sense that possibly with we don't really know if she's Mrs. Frankenstein. Or, Exactly, but mm -hmm. there's there's a sort of love between the two of them, and and uh, and this is an opportunity for them to create life for for, for, for their relationship, and um, and there's real search for um, aesthetic perfection, and in a way he's like a sort of statue of David. There's real beauty to him until mm -hmm. one starts to find um, the need to do perfection, and then the experiment goes wrong. The three D sort of like you know. Printing is like a gift for this, isn't it? It's a, such a clever idea in well, relation it's not to this. Really, an idea that 3D printing became obvious because people are, by the way, actually making body parts and organs, as we know. I mean, they've made a liver, apparently. I would like another one myself. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I mean, that's what I think yeah. that's what the driving factor is. It's such, such a unique concept. It's the reason why I think it works for the modern. Yeah. Today's audience. I think that's right. And I think that we are definitely, that's how it, eventually, if somebody does make an artificial human, that's, it will be a form of 3D printing. And, you know, one of the interesting things about bioprinting is that it was discovered because somebody actually intuited that the size of a human cell is about the size of an ink nozzle. So they didn't even really have to remake the equipment to actually start printing biological matter. And at the time that the book was written, there was a, a sort of a invention of, of electricity and, and the unknown of that form of energy that you can tap into, so it's still there. Well, but of course the thing is, even though theoretically it could be possible to artificially make the, 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 the organic material to make a human being, the thing of course that's still a mystery is how you would imbue it with life. Mm. And uh, so, and, and 
unconscious. Nobody thing. knows that part of it. Mm. And that's... What do you like working with? with God, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've done so many movies with him. What I is have, it? I have. Well, I'm... I'm uh, I'm sort of, uh, what am I? I'm, I'm, his, I'm his muse. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to serve. Really? I mean, yeah. what is it about him? Is, is there any particular sort of gift or talent? Uh, well, I think he's, uh, he's basically um, a genuine uh, uh, punk uh, 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 filmmaker. He's, he's, uh, he's always uh, breaking uh, barriers, and, and, uh, and we worked on one of the early uh, digital uh, films, uh, Ivan's Ecstasy. Um, and he, I hate complimenting Bernard uh, in any way, especially when I'm close to him. But uh, he he uh, he has a way of adapting classical pieces, um, and always stay faithful to them, but yet not in anything. I mean, and you said it in LA, obviously because of your Silicon Valley. I mean, was there any other sort of environment you thought mm, this will probably work here as well? I. I love Los Angeles as a kind of, I mean, of course, the James Whale film was shot in L.A. too, uh, on the Universal Backlot. Um, so there's something about Los Angeles that's, that seems to fit the story perfectly anyway, I think. But, but also now in L.A., the parts of L.A. that we use are mostly downtown and uh, sort of buildings out in Calabasas and out, just sort of out by the, you know, outside the city. And, and now L.A. has this sort of, Hundred years of history, at least now as a major city, and there are a lot, a lot of parts of downtown have this kind of very kind of elegant deco, but quite crumbly feel now, which is, which kind of relates back to the '30s and the classic period of filmmaking too, architecturally, especially downtown with the bridges and the things, and, and you know obviously that the whole thing of him ending up in Skid Row in downtown mm. uh, felt very natural. I mean, it is horrific in LA. There is an entire city of homeless people just, just down there. Mm. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you vaguely hinted that you're going to be doing another film. Another, your next film will be in the, the, the yes, classic correct. mode. Yes. I mean, what can you tell me about that? Well, I, I want to do more films. I like the idea of expanding the concept of what horror can be. Because to me, you know, horror, there's always a point where you... Horror is a very imitative genre. In the, you know, in the eighties, everything had to be a slasher film after Friday the Thirteenth, and you know, and then the nineties, yeah, uh, horror was kind of actually kind of a bit lost. But until I guess Blair Witch came along and everything, then there was the whole found footage mm. thing, and and then you know, it, and then there was the saw thing that everyone had to do that, and then now, and now it's it's all like uh, insidious and sinister and all that sinister those kinds of things, which you know. On all those films, have always the first couple of them are always really wonderful, and then there's the bucket yeah. loads of imitators. You know, to me, the horror genre should be a much broader church than that. And that, to me, I love that idea of of, of having a genre where where you can express uh, transgressive things and you can express dark things. There's there isn't this obligation for what I call the tyranny of positivity, <laughs> which the studios love, this idea that, whoa, you know, I remember, what, I remember when I made Anna Karenina for Warner Brothers, and I ran the film for them, and, and the head of the studio turned around to me and said, she's so unsympathetic, she cheats on her husband. And why does she have to jump onto a train? I know, <laughs> and you, but if it's a horror movie, you realize you can fuck who you want, kill who you want, eat the baby, you know, gorge on... <laughs> The innards of a priest, you know. It's uh, it's good. It's good for lunch. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yes. <laughs> Great guys, thanks so much. Yes, really you. appreciate it. Thank you.